And the tricky thing about Jesus' kingdom is when it looks like you're winning, you might be losing. And when it looks like you're losing, you might actually be winning. You see, in, first, in the first century Rome, Jesus, on the cross between two criminals, it looked like Rome was winning. Yet Jesus' followers keep insisting he's Messiah days later. Jesus' followers continue seeking to love those who don't love them in return. Jesus' followers continue to try and turn their enemies into neighbors. Jesus' followers continue to care for those not a part of their tribe, those the rest of society deemed not worth caring about. If you fast forward 100 years, you read a church historian named Tertullian. He's a feisty church historian. And he's in a bit of a, a debate, and he's writing to those in political power who hold to a different religious belief system than him. And he says to them, you forget that notwithstanding your persecution, far from conspiring against you, as our numbers would perhaps furnish us with the means of doing, you guys aren't treating us well. But instead of fighting back, we pray for you. We do good to you. That if we give nothing to your, the gods of your religion, we do give for your poor. And that our charity spreads more alms in your streets than the offerings presented by your religion and your temples. Jesus' followers are not against the other, they're for the other. If you fast forward 200 more years, you read the, emperor, the Roman Emperor Julian. And as, Christ, as the Christian movement was growing in the first four centuries, there were seasons where the Roman Emperor was favorable towards the Christian faith, and there were seasons where waves of persecution happened. And the Roman Empire, Emperor Julian was not down with the Christians. But he sees their charities, and so he launches a campaign to get his own religious charities to match the charity of the Christians. And so he writes to a pagan, his pagan priest, and he says, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priest, the Christians observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. The Christians support not only their poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. Only when death has lost its power does it make sense to live in this way? Why would you love those who aren't returning love to you? Why continue to seek to turn your enemies into your neighbors? Why continue to care for those who aren't a part of your tribe, but who are outside of your tribe, some of whom aren't even treating you that well? One more quote. This one's a dense one. It's by a guy named Tom Holland. He's a modern historian of classical antiquity. He's, he doesn't say he's a Christian, but he began to ask himself the question, why do I share certain values and beliefs about human beings and their worth and their dignity? Because as he studied classical antiquity, he realized, I didn't get that. Those, those values weren't passed to me from Sparta. Those values weren't passed to me from Rome. Look at this quote. He says, the more years I spent immersed in the study of classical antiquity, so the more alien I increasingly found it. The values of Leonidas, whose people had practiced a peculiarly murderous form of eugenics and trained their young to kill uppity Untermenschen, practice that, <laughs> by night, were nothing that I recognized of as my own. Nor were the values of Caesar, who was reported to have killed a million Gauls and enslaved a million more. But it wasn't just the extremes of callousness that unsettled me, but the complete lack of any sense that the poor or the weak might have the slightest intrinsic value. Why did I find this disturbing? Because in my own morals and ethics, I didn't get them from Sparta. I didn't get them from Rome. They couldn't have been passed down from these societies. Assumptions that I had grown up with about how society should properly be organized, the principles that it should uphold, were not bred of classical antiquity, still less of human nature, but very distinctively of that civilization's Christian past. So profound has been the impact of Christianity on the development of the Western civilization. My values, the dignity of human life, that every person is worth dignity and respect and to be treated honorably. These aren't from Rome. These aren't from Greece. You see, with Jesus on the cross, two criminals next to him. It looked like Rome was winning. But four centuries later, Rome is over half Christian. Four centuries later, Rome had stopped feeding people the lions. Four centuries later, Rome had, had stopped shedding blood for sport. Four centuries later, 
People, the poor, the outcasts, the marginalized, those who were once deemed to have no value in society, were now, those who were deemed worthless, were now deemed worthy. Were deemed worthy to be stood up for. What happened? Jesus' followers, against all other patterns of the world, against all other Messiah patterns, keep insisting he's Messiah, and they keep insisting on living in his way. Death had lost power. How did that happen? Jesus was raised from the dead. Why does his Messiah movement explode when all the other ones die? He was raised from the dead. Why does the Roman world change? He was raised from the dead. Why has our world changed and is still changing? He was raised from the dead.